कैशों कहा बिगड़िया जे मूंढे सौ बार मन को काहे न मूंढिए जामे विषय विकार सो द द वर्स वाज टाइटल टॉन्सरिंग अ हंड्रेड टाइम्स what harm have the head done you shave them a hundred times why not shave the mind there grows unchecked countless poisonous thoughts now the the fundamental principle how the scriptures how the gurus communicate to us is an objective representation to a subjective phenomenon everything that is depicted captured presented objectively has only a subjective phenomenon a subjective representation so an objective representation to a subjective phenomenon so what you see externally has to be related subjectively so whenever you have this very clear understanding that whatever is represented objectively is only being conveyed subjectively subjective is very subtle is very difficult to convey so they use the methodology of comparison to only convey that which is happening within us so the objective is external is easy to perceive easy to practice easy to follow but what is difficult to imbibe is that subtle representation and bring about an inner transformation since many people don't understand the external representation to an internal phenomenon most don't understand this in the spiritual field so they get carried away by the external acts they are more interested in the exterior of the spirituality not the interior of the spirituality spirituality is not determined by the external aspect it is determined and defined by the inner mental state not realizing this everybody goes through the mere external rituals which by themselves has no meaning has no significance if you don't understand what they convey which is what sant kabir is is directly uh, attacking all those who go through this exercise of merely tonsuring the head not understanding what that exercise symbolizes as the verse says the tonsuring of the head only symbolizes the cleansing of the mind the hair each hair follicle could be compared to the inner unmanifest unseen desire which your mind houses so each hair follicle is a desire so when i shave them off it means i am cleansing my mind of all the gross impurities of desires and attachments that's what it symbolizes you're not realizing since people flock to these religious pilgrimages i don't know whether you know india is the biggest exporter of hair and it is one of the most flourishing business industry in the in the world in the west where they do these hair transplants and what not and where does it come from and tirupati is one of the biggest spinner which supplies to all these 
high end uh, saloons and high end uh, uh, places where you get yourself treated where does it go from thanks to the blind mechanical practice of torturing the head mm -hmm. not just this now again again torturing of head is symbolic it conveys all the spiritual practices people perform without understanding the deeper significance and remember in the there's a lot of uh, fact uh, commonality a lot of references we can take from bhajagovindam which we have often been quoting in fact in the the 14th verse of bhajagovindam he says jatilo mundi lunchita keshaha kashayam bhara bahukrita vesha is it possible to extract that bhajagovindamma gayatrima all right jatilo mundi lunchita keshaha kashayam bhara bahukrita vesha pashyan api chana pashyati mudo pashyan api chana pashyati mudha the mudha the fool even though he sees he sees not Chudara nimittam bahukrita vesha. He puts on the very garb, the very disguise, only for the sake of the belly. He just goes through the various spiritual practices just to satisfy his hidden appetite for his own personal ends. But he has to. He, and why does he put on that garb, Sriniji? <laughs> Bahukruta Vesha, the very disguise, the various namams, whether you put vertical or horizontal, you put namam here on your forearms, you will put on malas, you will put on an ochre robe, you will tonsor your head with a tuft left behind, you will chant the various practices. All of this, the Adi Shankaracharya is attacking the mudhas. Why do they do that? But not, I'm not saying everybody who does that is like that. Eh? Don't, don't go about judging people like that. But people do get into it. The question is, why do they get into it? Uh, Pranam Guruji, I, I, I think it's what you kind of mentioned last time. It's the practice of what you call asceticism externally. Mm -hmm. So you want to show that externally that I am pure and and um, you know I, I guess that's that's what you're trying to communicate right? Right. yes it is it is they're practicing asceticism externally but why do they do it why do they take to it it is because it is very easy to do so it is very easy to put on a garb of spirituality and you don't need to do much. You just have to put on a garb. And the result is you will have everybody falling at your feet because people have an inward respect to the exterior. So let me ask you a question. Can I, if you permit me? I, you knew, may... I, knew, I knew this was coming. Therefore, I, I chose you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you had your morning coffee that means <laughs> oh I didn't know the coffee was the reason now I'll put <laughs> cause and effect together now <laughs> by the way I didn't uh, okay <laughs> yes so, sir please so the question you mentioned on you know on faith and tonsuring and um, in Tirupati so let me ask you a question people have faith and there is uh, it may not be the concept of showing asceticism externally. And it's proven that bodies are cured when mentally you're stronger, right? There's a lot of, you know, if, so if people have faith and they say, hey, I want to get better. And if I do get better, I'll turn show my head. So that's a mental focus of trying to get better. And I go to Tirupati or wherever. And I'm questioning that there, that is not to say I am uh, being reclusive. Uh, I'm trying to be, show this asceticism externally, but it's more of a faith kind of based healing and it's just a, a methodology to get there. So what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it. We're okay. not against the practice. 
we're not questioning the practice we're only trying to suggest please understand what you're practicing that's about all we're not against tradition the kabirji is not against the practice but please understand what it means so a simple thing you you chant you sing the national anthem you salute the national flag you put on a garb of a garment servant ritualistically religiously you do that the first thing you enter the office all the time you are trying to do international things <laughs> now what is the significance and meaning of all that you go through the practice i go through all the puja the rituals i do everything every morning but the moment i get into the field of arena grassly selfish self centered how can i cheat that fellow what can i get for myself constantly going through the ego battle proving yourself superior to others does this fit into how you have begin your day you begin your day with a, a spiritual assertion and you can't uphold that same spirit you can't allow that spirit to trickle into your actions i would question what question what is that purpose of that all the religious or the spiritual practices you're doing if it doesn't reflect in your actions so you can do what you want to do there's no qualms there's no restrictions as long as there's a transformation within you if that doesn't happen everything is being questioned what is the purpose even uh, you all are learning all this knowledge religiously you come week after week month after month year after year decade after decade if it doesn't help you to shed your own selfishness if it doesn't help you to bring in that spirit of service and sacrifice if it doesn't help you to identify with the knowledge which you are imbibing i would question what is the purpose of your association with this knowledge i have lived with the family i have a family let's say for 10 20 years but if i have not developed an identification love with my family i would question what am i doing with this family i am with the family physically but my love and heart or mind is somewhere else man what are you i am only externally with the family but mentally my mind is in love with somebody else with something else so if you are here with this knowledge if you believe this knowledge is something that you have identified with what am i doing to this knowledge is there an identification so wherever remember wherever there is love and identification what follows is service and sacrifice if you love your child you will sacrifice anything for your child wouldn't you you love sure. your home wouldn't you to go, go any length to 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 present it to showcase it to live in grand and in in you don't you deck it up don't you live it in style because you love your home if you love if you love anything you will give your time your energy your resources you'll serve it exactly the same way if you genuinely believe this knowledge is something which is serving me and if you identify with it you will go to any length to serve it not that it needs me i need to serve it so that it will benefit me the knowledge is to above all of us put together all we can do the knowledge doesn't need you and me nor me this is sanatana dharma it has stood the test of time which has been passed on time immemorial it doesn't need this little intellects of ours to do any grand thing to make some noise all the noise you make all your life will be dwarfed in all the ignorance that's around us you will not be able to impact even if you say oh i have impacted so many people it doesn't need you and me to keep it alive so i am doing it so that i evolve so if you don't serve your family you are not wanted in the family isn't it your family will say when well, yeah. this fellow is what is this is a pain in the neck you know you are not accepted in your own family so what makes you believe you one comes and takes it and not gives back to this knowledge not that the knowledge needs it but you need to give it you need to do it so that's the kind of uh, emphasis the emphasis is on inner transformation so don't give over importance to the external practices 
undermining the internal transformation. So if, what is the point me just merely torturing without cleansing the mind of its impurities? So people take to that because it's easy to practice. And that's what even Adi Shankaracharya, I think we have the reference. Uh, does, are you okay with that, Triniji? Perfect. Yes, Ma. So let's chant this mantra. Let's all sing along. Jati lo mundi lunchita keshaha kashayambhara bahukrita veshaha pashanna pichana pashati mudho shudarani metam bahukrita veshaha bahukrita veshaha yeah, it says all that very disguise for what? Shudharanimittam, for the sake of the belly. And what was the very disguise people go through? One with matted locks. They disregard the hair. So it will grow wild. One with head shaven. Jatilo mundi, lunchita kesha. One with hair pulled out one by one. That will be torture, no? So they are subjecting themselves to such torturous practices in the name of spirituality. And some put on a very disguise of a robe. The easiest is to do that. And then he calls all the people who give importance to the external spiritual practices. Pashyanapi, nacha pashyati mudha. The mudha, a fool, though he is in it, he sees not. Though seeing, he sees not. Indeed, all this very disguise, just for the sake of a personal hidden appetite. Are you doing it for yourself? If you do all this for yourself, you are a fool. You're fooling yourself, not the world. You think, oh, I have fooled the world. If I'm doing something, oh, I've misled all of you to make me believe I'm true. Forget me trying to do to mislead you all. I have misled myself first. It's not the world, it's me, myself, I'm fooling. Yeah, I'm reminded of a story which I've quoted before, but it's apt here. There was an elderly king who was in his, almost in his deathbed, but he had a, a wish. He wanted to see a celebrated Swami. He wanted to have an audience of a wise soul. He was a very honest king, a very righteous man, but he wanted to have a darshan. So he told his ministers, he told his people, please find someone. But they didn't heed his request that seriously. So what happened? They let time pass. This old man keeps asking many things, you know, don't have to take him seriously. But he was still the king. But one day he got very restless and annoyed with these fellows not doing. And he was very genuine, very keen to meet a Swami. He said, if you fellows don't get me a Swami in the next one week, you all fellows will be sacked. And they all got restless. And then they started frantically searching for a swami. You know, as Kabir said, these fellows are all crooked fellows. They couldn't find a single wise fellow because their mindset was crooked. So they came up with a master plan. They said, what we'll do? The king only wants to meet a swami. So what they did as they were searching, they found a young fellow a recluse. He was sitting as a begging on the street. See, they just picked up that fellow. He was terrified. Why are these fellows, the government servants, picking up? No, 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 I have not stolen anything. Just keep your mouth shut. Come with us. They take him away and they come into an agreement with him. He said, we are going to give you a job and we'll give you something which you have never seen nor would you have dreamt in your whole life. We'll give you a bag of gold. What? A bag of gold? Yes, a bag of gold. Now, what am I supposed to do? In fact, they, they showed a bag of gold also. This is, we'll get this, but you should do exactly what we say. Yes, sir. They told him that you will have to put on a garb of a Swami. Don't worry, we will do everything. We'll deck you up with a Swami. You'll have to sit under a tree for one week. On the fifth day, the king will come with his entourage to have a darshan of you. And as the king would come, it is customary and tradition. When you go to meet 
a wise man, you offer something. This is the fundamentals of visiting a guru. So he is, and I know for certain he'll come with an entourage and a king coming, he'll not just bring a, a chocolate bar with him. He will come with a, a host of gifts. So what you got to do when the king comes to you, whatever is offered, you should not accept anything. That is the condition. If you receive and accept anything that is given, we will reveal you that you are a fake sannyasi and the king himself will punish you. You might even get a capital punishment for misleading the king. So watch out what you do. No, 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 no. All I want is a bag of gold. No worry. Whatever you told, it will be done. So for one week, the day one starts and he is decked up head to toe. All this varied disguise, namam, mala, tilak, tonsuring of head and everything, drama, the setup is done. And people, the first few days, people started noticing, hey, this fellow is a, and he is supposed to sit and meditate, that's all. Sit quietly and do, keep muttering something mentally. Once you mutter mentally, don't know whether you're singing a Bollywood song or you're chanting Vedic mantra. That doesn't know. So mentally, you can do what you want, but externally, you've got to be very disciplined. Okay, sir, no problem. And this fellow is a fantastic actor. I tell you, he was, even Sir Lawrence Olivier would have been envious of this fellow. Fantastic actor. And he started drawing attention from everybody passing by. Hey, who is this man? Who is this Swami? This seems to be a very wise, wise fellow. I don't know any people started flocking around him. And the time came, he was notified in the morning that King E will be arriving at 11 o'clock the morning. And then we are told the queen also is accompanying and all the ministers also coming because the king going anywhere is just not okay. King goes all goes on his own. So the big entourage will come. Be prepared, huh? All these four days, you did good drama. We've been watching you. But today is your test. I said, no problem, sir. The time came. The big entourage arrives. First thing, when the king sees the Swami, he is so delighted. I never knew that round the corner, such a wise man was there. And it's my loss, it's my loss. And he, first thing, what the king does, he prostrates to the, prostrates to whom? To whom does he prostrate? Redigaru. To the actor, Pranam Guruji. Sir, you have not been following the story. Should I start from beginning now? No, no, no. I am following very clearly. Ah. Whom did he prostrate? So, it's an actor who has been acting as a guru. He is, ah, he prostrated to a fake Swami. Yeah, that's, that's what I said. <laughs> actor. actor <laughs> guy, but uh, as far as the... <laughs> The, the king is concerned is a Swami, but you and I know you're the fake Swami. All right? Yes. yes. So he prostrate. So first the king prostrates, the queen prostrates, everybody, the ministers prostrate. But the two fellows who mastermind all this, they were standing at a distance and watching all this drama going on. Oh, so far, so good. The drama is going very well. And the king just looked at those two fellows. The king himself and the queen and the prostrate, these two fellows standing arrogantly. When the king looked at them, they also came and had to come and prostrate by that fellow. And this fellow was laughing within himself. Aha, uh -huh. I just put on a garb and the king was at my feet, the queen was at my feet, the ministers and these fellows also prostrating to me. Ring up, ah, this is, seems to be a very good uh, business. And then the, the king offered clothing, jewelry, food, money, he said, I don't think you have a decent place. Please give me the opportunity to be a small thing, but I'll, I'll put up a small putty or an ashram for you so you can, you can sit in an environment which you think is ideal for you and carry on what you're doing. Please give me the opportunity. What he was told to say, and he said so gracefully, he just kept telling, take it away. No, thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, I'm very happy contented. The king was so pleased that this man rejected everything. Again, they prostrated and they left. And as the whole entourage left, these two fellows came running to ensure this fellow doesn't follow for the bag of gold. And they came and this fellow was still sitting, meditating. And they quietly called him to the side and said, boy, you have far overseeded your ability to perform this act. We are mightily impressed. And we have decided to give you two bags of gold, not one, two bags of gold. 
and we want to end the contract. The contract was one back, but we are, we are increasing it. We're giving it done because the king was mightily pleased. They have done the job. And then comes the transformation. This boy who was a beggar, was a fake swami, he told those two fellows, you sit. Haven't you seen all that transpired today and the last few days? I have just put on a garb of spirituality and what not came my way. I had name, I had fame, I had wealth, I had food. I had the king at my feet. I had you fellows at my feet. And I, all I did, I just put on a garb of a renunciate. If I truly renounce the world inwardly, what would I not achieve in life? And that's when these two fellows realized, man, this guy has got some stuff. And that's when they truly prostrated to him. This is the different synergy in being externally an ascetic and internally being an ascetic. And what's the crux is you don't do this for something. If you do for something, that also is a waste. You do it for the higher. So the most important thing is to take your mind off the world and plant it on the self. So all these practices is only trying to achieve the most difficult thing that is to shift your mind to the self, shift your mind to the higher. But remember, it is very easy to get rid of your possessions. It is very difficult to get rid of your possessiveness. So an external ascetic may dispossess, but would have the possessive attitude. I repeat, an external ascetic is forced to live a life of dispossessive. He would not possess the basic amenities and facilities. He would not live a life of comfort and convenience. He would be living in a with a meager earning, with a with whatever comes his way, he, he, he just lives as bare as minimum. He is forced to because he's practicing externally that asceticism, but internally he still is cursed with that possessive attitude. But spiritual man may possess, may enjoy, but what? they have achieved that they have got rid of their possessive attitude. So external asceticism is dispossession and a possessive attitude. And internal asceticism is either possession or dispossession, doesn't matter. You don't have to possess, but if you possess, that doesn't affect your inner state of a dispossessive attitude. You got to get this, seal this. This is what the verse is conveying. The Shastras are conveying. So you can do what you want. You can be where you are, but you have an attitude of being dispossessive. That's the crux. It doesn't matter whether you put on a garb or not. You can be in the marketplace without, with this attitude of detachment. You are a swami. You are a sannyasi. In the sixth chapter of the Gita, the first verse, he says, Anashrita karma phalam karyam karma karotiyaha. Sa sanyasi, sa yogi, na nirag nirna chakriya. You should not get tired listening to this mantra or oh, any of these verses. Anashita kar, karma phalam. He who renounces the fruit of action, karyam karma, you do your obligatory duty. Good morning, 4 o'clock till 6.30, just before we were alive. I can't tell you the number of things I've done. 
and i am not trying to advertise or impress the number of things i have done the number of things i said it should be certain things had to be a print out had to be taken it had to be kept in the file i had to be ready for the meeting i had to whatever i had to do I had to do my study i had to do my writing i had to whatever I had. so many things you have to do why are you doing it karyam karma it is my obligate duty and you do that anashita karma phalam what is the phalam of that i have renounced it i am not interested in it i don't need to know what the karma phalam is it's not that i have the karma phalam dangling in front of me and say i renounce it no i am not even interested to know what's the karma phalam can you determine the karma phalam of a karma question i'm asking is keshav reddy garu can you determine determine the karma phala of a karma hari om guru ji Hari Om Sir, Namaskar. Yes, Sorry sir. for the delay in responding. Um, uh, may I request you to repeat the question once again to understand? Not at all. No problem. What I am asking is, can one determine or can one know the karma phala of a karma? Means, can one limit i'm i'm translating it correctly can one limit the fruit of an action no swami ji why do you say no cuz you do not know how others the 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 karma people who are involved in the karma are associated with the karma whether they are up to the your expectation or their their level of understanding things we are not sure of that but we do our job because we are sure we are clear about what we intend to do and uh, as geeta said don't depend upon the phala do your job so with that conviction if you do it um, and sometimes you may get phala sometimes you may not get phala sometimes you may get phala more than you expected or more than you anticipated sometimes you may be disappointed with um, a very i mean you didn't get the minimum thing so therefore you do not know what exactly it would be this is Absolutely. what i understand no no you 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 very very correct very correct but what i am trying to thank you ji but what i am trying to convey by saying you cannot limit the fruit of an action of the most important point we are establishing is the action is neutral any action you perform is neutral it's neither good nor bad so an action can be selfish unselfish or selfless based on the motive or the intent now the simple act as i've said from 4 to 6 now i believe 629 ashama just so lovingly as she does every time she sends me a, almost whenever i see a message i'm short of tears i must tell you that the way she writes that message the full of devotion full of love mm-hmm. sadar pranam anek aabhar ram ji ki krupa rahe these are the words you know they are so pregnant with that blessing and love you can't translate them you can't capture them so just even before the thing at 628 she just sent me a message 
and I saw the message coming. Another minute or so, I'm going live. I still said, no, I should respond to her. I said, Hari Om Ma. I said, no, did I do to impress her? Did I do to feel her comfortable? Is there a motive in my act? So if my action is selfless in nature, if I'm doing because it is my dharma, it is my duty, what can be the fruit of that selfless action? And if I keep on continuing to perform unselfish and selfless actions, what can be the fruit of such action? The fruit. Okay, let me ask Hirenji. That's what my initial question was. Can you, what was the initial question? Can you determine the karma phalam of a karma? Of the karma. Yeah, I'd like to go a little bit more behind it. When we do a project, I'm telling my personal experience, we more or less where we want to achieve, right? This is where we want to achieve. We plan for it on cost, on what has to be built and on time, right? And we try to achieve that. So we more or less try to work towards this. Although I think as I understand, a lot of times, most of the times we probably achieve it. And a lot of sometimes we don't achieve it. When Gita says about karma phalam, if we don't achieve it, we should not be killing ourselves or we should not be losing our faith in anything. But when you say determine, I, be, I believe myself that if I, if I know what I want to do in physical work, spiritual work, physical work, I can determine my decision. If I do a good job, if I got a good team, if I motivate a good team, we get there. But a lot of times we may not be getting there and how much we can get up from falling down, that is what it matters, is not it? That how much we get disturbed that somebody might have a big problem, the project didn't work, this happened, it, happened, it does happen. That how much you really fall down or can you have faith in yourself and other people and try to work it out and get up again and going. And See, all, not all of that would only happen if you are interested in the fruit. When your accent is on the outcome, whether with appreciation, whether it, we are following, where there's a reciprocation, whether is there a gratitude or is there a note of thank from you receive from those you have served, you have helped, you've been there for them, but people are thankless. Yeah. Okay. If you even expect a kind of a note of appreciation for your efforts, that also is an expectation. You may not be rewarded in terms of recognition or name, but you still, you have to do your dharma, your duty as a father, as a teacher, as a student, as a son, as a citizen of a country, you have to do your dharma. So once you perform your action, that's the point we are saying, you should not be interested in the fruit. So if you just remove the fruit out of the equation and just keep doing it every call, yeah. At every call, what's my duty? What's my duty? Keep performing your duty. And such actions, what is the fruit that can come out? So the act is neutral, as I've said. What you can gain of that, you can actually gain salvation. The action of performing selfless actions gives you liberation, gives you moksha, salvation. Because it gets rid of the desires. It purifies of your impurities. You spiritually evolve. And if you continue to march, you'll get to the ultimate goal of self-realization. Therefore, he gives the, one of the, 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 the verse in the sixth chapter, the first verse of the Gita, as I've quoted. If you do that, renouncing the fruit of action, perform your karma. He, he calls him a sannyasi, a yogi. 
who is a sanyasi sanyasi is not a one who is wearing this robes and being in the marketplace not one who has the external ascetic an internal ascetic is one who has renounced the fruits and expectations and he does his dharma what poles are one is north pole other is south pole this is internal asceticism internal asceticism is renouncing your possessiveness your ego your attachments interest in the fruits and you keep doing what your dharma or karma is you can be a butcher you can be a carpenter you can be a singer you can be a whatever you are just do your dharma i tell you that is the it takes you to the pinnacle of perfection which is realization and that an action of that nature alone can give you yeah and find yes sir with this you find relevance of this is so so apt and important so anybody out there wherever you are each of you come from a different background different roles different duties demands from you yet the principle is applicable to everyone none of you have to give up anything none of you have to renounce anything none of you have to put on an act of anything just be what you are renounce the the inner so i ask you a question uh, when you say possession it doesn't mean necessarily the physical possessions we have it is also the minds cleanliness right basically what you are saying that renunciation of anything you do don't that i did or whatever it is mr ram condigno explained that other other day in terms of his project he said it, anything works out it is all we did it not necessarily i did it right absolutely yes Okay. So you renounce the the arrogating notion, yes, the attribute you give to yourself. You renounce that. There is no ahankar. There is no. In the previous mantra, I said, "Why are you proud? What are you proud of? You know, why that arrogance?" So what you get rid of is the the inner the inner ego. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Right. thank you yes sir keshav reddy sir to begin with yes sir hari uh, om swami ji yes sir namaskar uh, what the guru swam guru ji told about uh, doing karma so dharma i just uh, two things two persons came to my mind one is swami vivekananda who went abroad and uh, gave a lecture in the religion i mean in the conference of uh, religions where he declared about hinduism the greatness of uh, sanatan dharma and he became popular all over the world and today he is known all over the world second person was uh, uh, bhakti vedanta prabhupada swami who was a very ordinary person and um, he went with great difficulty to united states of america and started teaching about lord krishna and today iskon is his founder he is the founder of this iskon and all over the world they are doing great service this is what it, they thought that it is their dharma and they did it with great sacrifice they suffered a great deal in performing their dharma and today the whole world recognizes their uh, contribution and there have been people who believe them who follow them are benefited this is what i wanted to mention to you hari om guru ji now not to <coughs> undermine what these great men you refer to have done but it would be injustice to the famous tyagaraja kirtana endaro mahanubhav andariki na vandanam how can i single out one or two and say these people have done far more than others 
it is wrong on our part to single out anybody or oh, my guru has done far more than this guru or that guru has done so much more there is galaxy of sages and saints who have given their lives given everything that they had to serve this cause without them we we don't we are not we don't even have a text to fall back on we don't have a scripture so we have to bow down to every guru who has upheld this guru parampara the guru shishya lineage so we should not single it out but i appreciate your your perspective with which you came from but we should never be singling out we bow down to that lineage All right sir uh, we i we don't uh, hear you sir sorry could you please unmute yourself sir arvind guru ji don't just example i as you rightly said endro mahan was thousands and thousands generations and generation i mean millions of people must have done some people have gone unrecognized they never yes. nobody knows about them like freedom fighters many people have not been recognized though they have done great sacrifice just what to remember you know in respect of our own country many freedom fighters who have done great sacrifice are unknown similarly yes. all our sanatana dharma right great rishis we do not know even their names we do not know who who they are i agree totally uh, forgive me not my intention is not to ignore others no, no. but not to just uh, give a small examples what the modern world knows yes hari om no no hari no no i i am glad uh, we we understand and it's not to uh, that you you give importance to one from the other but i just wanted to clarify that you know no no forgiveness sir please all right thank you yes harish priyam guruji yes harish priyam guruji um i something has been on my mind for many weeks guruji and one of your sentence earlier says that we do our obligatory duty without any expectation of fruit of action now uh, guruji my question is how do we define obligatory duty in a sense guruji we are living in a society with family friends work and a community as a whole so we have obligatory duties in each of those spectrums now i've come to realize guruji from my interactions with people around the world in all four spectrums of work employment family and friends that people are having an attitude of expectation and entitlement so when we are doing our duties some of us we are asked to do 100% but we out of our care and concern we give 150% of ourselves in that duty and over the time guruji people are having an expectation and entitlement of 150% when actually they don't have that right to to have that expectation so when i have realized this over years instead of overdoing everything in excess and reducing the quotient from 150% back to a 90 to 100% threshold of duty and in that part people are starting to find that i'm being selfish i'm not giving because i overgave at one point now i'm just coming back to baseline 90 to 100 instead of being 150% so at what point guruji where do i determine where the obligatory duty stops at what threshold do we stop without being selfish in that sense how do we gauge the temperature i find it very difficult because sometimes i did i do something but now i feel i don't want to do it for that situation or that individual not because i'm selfish because i feel i should conserve that part of my self for a for a cause that's needed more at some point later i'm conserving it not to be selfish but just to just to conserve it for a better requirement not necessarily to give my 150% for that specific reason of person at that point 
and I don't feel it's selfish. So at what point do I gauge where I'm drawing the line in my day-to-day life with all these spectrums of our lives? This is where I'm struggling, Guruji. Right. So obviously it's not uh, a financial thing you're talking because your obligations and your roles and responsibilities is not just material and financial, it's, it's physical, it demands emotionally, intellectually, spiritually as well. Am I right? Yes, in the spirit of giving, the desire is not as intense as it was once upon a time. Again, it's right. not because it's being selfish, it's because I feel there's too much expectation and entitlement out there. And I don't like the, I don't feel that attitude is right. It's coming from the recipient on that space. Okay. Now, now how much person do you think I should answer? I'm doing my duty. You answer the question. How much person should I answer? 80%, 90%, 100% or 150%? You tell me. I'm not selfish. So how much person should I give you? In the day, I've already got schedule of talking to various people. I've told them, call me at 9.30, call me at 1.30, call me at 4 o'clock. And they have pertinent questions, concerns their life, and they're connecting with me. And I've told them, please call them. How much I should give them when they call and connect with me? What percentage I should do? I'm doing my duty as a teacher, as someone wanting to seek something from me. What should I give? Hold back, hold back something? Not that I'm selfish, but should I not give? What go to 30%, 40%? That should not be the attitude. They could be people who are just taking this knowledge for granted, but I should not be any less because you take it for granted. I will do my dharma or duty. If you are an unfit, you if you're not a dhikari, you yourself will fall away. Or my effort to transform you will change you to be a, an adhikari. As a giver, as my dharma to do my duty, why should I compromise on my ability to do? Not that I'm overdoing. You only ask me one verse of the Gita and I confine you and I give you the entire chapter of the Gita, that is not, that's overdoing. You ask me one question of one verse, let's say you're asking me, what does the first verse of sixth chapter explain? I'm explaining the entire sixth chapter. You say, Guruji, I don't want the entire sixth chapter. Please explain to me that verse, please. That is my dharma. So it is your presence of mind that you always calibrate your actions to the requirements. So the blame is on me, not the, not the seeker. Who told you to go overboard? You, you got carried away. That is not your duty. You got carried away with certain acts. Now you are trying to rationalize and say, I should not, I should not overdo it. You get it? Don't, Rajima, please don't unmute anybody beforehand because it is an echo. Right. So you get me, Harish. You, you, one should not get emotionally carried away with any duty or responsibility. You got to measure your, so when you say movement, you say duty, it means your objective. You're not emotionally carried away. Your duty demands to be objective and perform your duty at that point. And whatever you do, give 150% to it. Give your life to it as if that's the last action you're performing. Do it with grace and dignity. Do it with such honor. Do it with such purity that thinking that action can take, give me salvation. Just now I said, what can determine the karma phala? Any action can give you the phala of realization. Cannot, can it not? You know, in the Mahabharata, after the war, the Pandavas threw a party to celebrate their victory. And everybody were invited. And 
and it was a, a an occasion where everybody were doing different jobs assigned but lord krishna was was not given a portfolio or job to do so he was just sort of jobless he didn't have anything to do so he went up to this to and said to this i feel very odd not doing anything give me some job to this i said how can i tell you what to do if you wish to do whatever you wish to do please go ahead he told and the story goes vidhistra real sorry sir, the lord lord krishna realized that everybody had left their footwear outside the the hall it was all like any temple you know one footwear is here other footwear is somewhere else so you'll have to spend little uh, time to even get your footwear back that's literally the case so what he did he went about arranging the the, the slippers and the all the footwear in the stands and he did it did it so diligently with such dexterity all were attracted to his act of just aligning the footwear so much so nobody came into the auditorium so jishtra came and said krishna please allow them inside the the gathering is inside not outside <laughs> now what do you gain from that it is not what you do that matters is how you do it and if you do it with that bhavana that dexterity that care and concern and you are doing only what your dharma demands you to do i am only asked the first verse of the chapter not the entire chapter to so do what you are asked and when you do it give your 150% not just 80 90% you are not overdoing it do it and such actions when you when you do it with objectivity you would never go wrong there after i have taught you so much are you following everything that i taught you harish how long you have known me 15 years are you following everything that i told you is any guarantee you will follow what i am telling you now no thank okay. you i knew that answer so there is no guarantee you following everything that i'll tell i know you did not follow everything i told because you came and told me <laughs> not that i am sitting and constantly uh, following whether you are following everything i am saying you yourself it's that it's that affection and bond we have you come and told me guruji i am not able to do that and yet you have told yes. me now it makes more sense i remember you coming and telling me many time what you have been telling makes more sense to me now than what it meant before but you have been telling the same thing if i had that expectation that you should follow what was told from the time it was said i would be very dejected and i would be having a serious concern because you are not following what i'm saying i would say why are you coming you are not following what i'm saying why are you coming to me will i not say that yes ashrita karma phalam karyam karma i did that karyam karma of advising when it was sought then i am doing the karyam karma of advising what you have asked now how much percent 150% give yourself to it as if this is the last action and do it with such grace so don't hold back thank you very much most welcome rish most welcome yes sir jibhi karo gur chapan sir Jai Guru Dev. Namaskar, Sir. Jai Guru Dev. Hari Om. Hari Om. The all our scriptures to bring back that wisdom, that is uh, truly the freedom. To that, the whole scriptures, right from the Vedas to Bhagavad Gita, all the whoever catch that is the essence what we discussed today. Of one who is devoid of attachment, who is liberated. whose mind yes. is established in knowledge that knowledge that supreme knowledge to reach moksha all is of one who is devoid of attachment who is liberated whose mind is established in knowledge who acts for the sake of sacrifice who acts for the sake of sacrifice all his actions are dissolved so there's the no tie no tiring that the you don't get tired when you got attached only only things you are tired 
if you don't get attached, you have the even sleep. People, you know, rishis and all, even the, uh, they don't uh, have a sleep like Lakshman, 14 years. The unattachment, that is uh, which it gives you the strength. So that is the uh, ultimate to reach the, that is what all these courses, uh, wisdom, are the, uh, what you have uh, today's uh, uh, whole essence, what I think that is, I want to uh, make it that is uh, from my side. Jai Guru Dev. Yes, sir. So you are very, very envious at you, sir. Because you have taken all the essence and kept with yourself. <laughs> huh? Now we don't have anything left with us here. So please, I'm glad you shared it because now we have it with us. You know, you're rightly said, very, very rightly said. That's the essence. That's the real essence. I appreciate it.